So we're really happy to have you here. I want to welcome all of you here at our Minnetonka location, as well as our other six locations here in the metro area. It is my pleasure and honor to be able today to introduce to you one of our very nears and dears, favorite members, Martin DeBartis. Thank you for being here. Martin was born and raised in New England. He moved to the Twin Cities after accepting a new position with a local company that wanted to expand and grow. He spent the majority of his professional career managing businesses, relationships in a highly complex, emotional, and competitive market, serving a client base of Fortune 100s to 5000s. Wow, very impressive. During his career, he developed his, he's developed a strong depth of experience in client relations, employee development, and overall management. He's married to the love of his life, has two has twin granddaughters and one son-in-law and a grandson that is very dear to him, very special. All of, all of them are, right? Yes. Outside of work, he and his family love enjoying time together and exploring all that the metro area has to offer. With that, in this huge group, give yourself a big woo-woo. Woo-woo! And please, warm welcome for Martin. Yeah, all right. Hey! Right. Hey. Woo-woo! Well. I'm going to thank Mr. Martin for hosting us today. So you know how your mind works? You always remember things that all of a sudden they come up when something's happening. So I always remember uh, one of my first presentations ever at a company that I had just joined where one of the people in the room was somebody that uh, I used to travel with all the time. We were doing sales calls. He actually was on the World Series championship teams for the Cincinnati Reds. And every time I would start a presentation, he would yell from the back of the room, stand up! And I was standing up. This is all you're going to get, okay? And he would continue those kinds of things. Like when we were traveling together, and it was Lent, he'd take me to the best steakhouse in Atlanta to test my results. Um, so anyway, his name is Daryl Chain. Look him up. He is a one cool guy. So um, when, when I started thinking about this, I, I felt that there might be a way to kind of center this around some of the things that, that I've learned both professionally and personally. And I, I was reading a book, and in this book, it's uh, Stephen Covey, Eighth Habit. He, he has this part, this page, in which he has this quote from a book. He doesn't even tell you who the author is. It says, between stimulus and response, there's a space. Okay? And in that space lies our freedom and power to choose and respond. And in those cho choices lie our growth and happiness. And when I was thinking about that, so I said, okay, what does that really mean? Okay. So here's what it means. So you have stimulus, right? And it could be anything. It could be in business, but it could be personal, it could be professional. And you have in that space that freedom and power to choose our response. So on the stimulus, you have little or no control what happens, right? But your response, you own it, right? You can't say that somebody made you do it, right? You own that response. And if you take advantage of that space, that's where in client relations, you have your biggest chance for a win, okay? And so what I'm, what I'm thinking about is, let's talk about flat tire, okay? Get a flat tire. Years ago, I'm in Dallas, Texas. I'm running a company. It's a growing company. We're managing millions of dollars of real estate that's at risk. Okay? And I got a flat tire on the way to work. I didn't do well. So I walked in, and I was behaving as a good Sicilian would behave when he had a flat tire. So a couple hours later, one of my best friends who worked for me came in and says, 
Are we out of business? Are we closing down? Are they shutting us down? Are we all getting fired today? And the reason they all were thinking that was the middle. <laughs> my response to getting a flat tire bled over into how my team thought we were doing that day. Total impact on the performance of my team until so somebody had the courage to knock on my door and go, what's going on? And so, flat tire. Maybe today one of us got cut off in traffic. You have an upset, upset client who calls. Food's not cooked right or it's late, right? Um, or you're a team member put a client at risk. Those are all the things that can happen. But here is where the win is. Okay, so a lot of what we're going to talk about today is the middle of that. What's between stimulus and response and how you take that and what you can do with it. So, as I said, you have no control. And I said, you have little or no control. The only time I thought that you might have control was the movie War Games. Everybody remember that, Matthew Broderick? And the control you had was not to play. That's the only way you won. Well, if we're in client relations and we're in business, we're going to have to choose to play. So that's the way it goes. So when I think of the focus for today, what I'm hoping to accomplish is to give you some points, some skills, some approach to how to improve customer alignment, how to bring structure to inconsistent processes, how to defend against threats. My goal is that you're going to select some actions, maybe you highlight them on your PowerPoint and say, hey, I'm going to try this or I'm thinking of this. Um, but select some actions today that result in better relationships tomorrow. Okay. Have you ever lost a client and you didn't see it coming? Anybody have that happen to them? Well, I have. I'll be the first one to admit it. Okay. Okay. I had a client. This, this is what happened is I was sitting at my desk and I was looking at the service evaluation results and the line by line report for all of the clients that were I was responsible for in a region. And I happened to look at this client and I saw that they were like number three in service. I mean, think about it. This client's number three in our service that we were delivering. Mail got dropped off and on the top of the mail, the mail person in our office hands me a certified letter. Open that certified letter and it was a termination notice from that client. So I called them up and I said, what happened? I said, I'm, I literally am looking at reports that saying we virtually can't get much better in service to the people, the transferee, where this relocation, the people that we were moving. He said, no, you can't, but you lost sight of me. So what do you do with that? Do I go to the relationship manager and say, hey, you're fired? You know, what you do with that is you learn. And from that learning, I figured out I don't never want to get blindsided again. <coughs> so what I'm going to share with you is drawn from, I always get worried about saying it, let's use 30 plus years, okay, of <laughs> managing business relationships, hiring people, building businesses. Uh, one time I was told, hey, we want to build a business move to Dallas, we're going to give you 15, 17, 15, 17 million dollars revolving credit, hire people, go out there and buy distressed real estate, turn it over, hold it, make some money. Um, so in all of those cases, everything I did, I had to hire the people and identify people who could manage those relationships. Because we would be talking sometimes to the CEO or the CFO of a major bank or a major corporation. When I said Fortune 100 to 5,000, I'm actually talking Fortune 10 and all the way up, okay? Um, dealing with every, every phase of what that could be. So I'm, I'm sharing this with you for, for really one real good reason is that there's a lot in here. Hopefully it can help you in what you do. Uh, and I, Jason and I have been talking about just the need about sharing information, sharing experiences to help me, hopefully make somebody's life, somebody's business better. So hopefully this works. Okay, so what, when I started thinking about this, when I started putting it together, um, I, I, I 
discerners decided that there were seven keys to, to success in managing a relationship. As I said, they were built all along and around my career, the success and the failures. We all know about what failures can do, right? You learn more from when you fail than sometimes when you succeed. You know, when you succeed, you go, I got that, right? And you just walk on and you're really confident. When you fail, you go, oh my, what happened? Let me figure it out. So each one of these, I believe, supports the ability to get better in our craft of managing those business relationships, those to keep successful relationships in play. But you're going to have to spend time in each area to get the benefit, the maximum benefit from this approach. And without a documented approach, you can easily miss something that could lead to a client loss, dissatisfaction, or a dysfunctional team. Okay? And when, when I always would talk about managing the relationships that, that I was dealing with, you have to get past the fact that it's you. It's not just you. If it's not, if you don't involve your team, you're missing something. Um, you know, we have a, an EOS implementer in, in the crowd here, Mark over here. I'm sure Mark could attest that. You know, when, when he is working with a company and... He's an Excuse me? He's an integrator. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> integrator, okay. Um, you, you, you have to involve everybody to really get the, the maximum out of it. So let's get into it. <coughs> so foundation, here's where I'm talking about, is what, what I would like you to do is right next to the foundation on your notes, basically say move yourself forward. Move yourself forward every day. And what you're looking to do is identify strengths and areas of improvement, take responsibility for your own growth and development. So I've got some actions here that you can possibly take. And some of them, you know, may seem like, wow, what does that really mean? Okay, but think about it. You know, if, uh, okay, years ago, my phone rings. And it's my boss. And he says to me, hey, we're sending you to charm school. <laughs> and I said, what's that? Well, he says, it's the Center for Creative Leadership, and you're going there for a week, and it's a leadership development program. And I said, when I was in Dallas, building a company, running, going all over the place, working 60 hours a week already, I said, I'm not going. And he laughed, and he said, hey, everybody bet that that's what you would say. You're still going to go. So. In the mail comes, this is back in the day before everything was online, in the mail comes a box. In that box is all of these questionnaires that I have to hand out to the people who report to me, to my peers, and the people who I report into. And worst of all, there was hundreds of questions that I had to answer about myself. So as mad as I was before, when that box arrived, that was even worse. So stimulus, response, that space between was really short. I was really mad. I got it all done. But on top of that box, before I mailed it back, I wrote a handwritten letter to the people who were going to open that box. And I said, if at the time this is over and that week is over, I expect a check. If I'm not happy, I expect a check written to my company for this amount of money, my time, my loss of productivity, and my company's expenses. I signed it, I sealed it, and I sent it in. So I arrived in San Antonio, Texas on a Sunday morning, really happy about that. And uh, I'm at a hotel where they have, we've all been there, right? Where you have the reception area at the hotel lobby and the registration desk, and I walk in. And there's a couple people in line in front of me. There's a nice person sitting at the desk. And she's saying, hi, thanks for coming, here's your package. Hi, thanks for coming, here's your package. We're meeting you there, there's coffee over here. And then I walk up and I look up and she looks up at me and I say, hi, I'm Marta DeMarty. She stops what she's doing. She turns around to the half a dozen people who are running the program and she says, he's here. 
<laughs> so I said, oh boy, I guess they read it, right? And so the person who's running this, the, the, the workshop comes to me and she said, just so you know, you have made my job getting ready for this the most difficult I've ever had. I said, why? She said, because when we got your response, there's seven counselors that are going to work individually with uh, some of the people who are there. We had we fought over who was going to get you. Everybody wanted you because nothing, the collective experience of this entire group, we have never gotten a response like yours. And we will be prepared at the end of the week that if you're not satisfied, you write you that check. So fast forward. It's the end. And um, sitting with my counselor and my counselor says to me well let's before you ask for your money i've got it right here but before you ask for your money let's go through some things and one of the things he shared with me was my myers briggs results okay everybody who's ever been had a myers briggs result you know that you've got extrovert and introvert and in the middle it's kind of like you know that's where the balance is right tipping points well my line was pretty much right in the middle. I'm saying, hey, that's pretty good, man. I'm feeling good about that. He said, oh, no. Let's look where there are no other lines except on either side. It was like a dumbbell. Or if you're lifting it, it would bend. And I said, wow. I wonder what that means. He says, well, let me tell you what it means. So he took out the collective responses of 39 other people who had been with me. This is what they said to me. When you're inside Martin's world, it's warm, it's safe, and we feel like we can do anything. When you're outside, it's as cold as the Arctic Circle, and all we're worried about is how do we get back in. Now, the reason I'm sharing that is stimulus and response and the impact you have on other people. You always have to be aware of that. And so, you know, in order to be truly effective, you have to start with you. That was a changing point in my life. That day, that Friday, San Antonio, Texas. Because I walked out of there realizing that everything I had been taught before, everything up until then was wrong, right? If, it, if this would, I'd be the 80s version at that time of the distracted boss. You know, the guy who's running everywhere, thinking he's doing everything. And in reality, I was totally counterproductive as to who I was, who I should be. So, in order to truly be effective in managing client relations, managing your life, be selfish. Start with yourself first, okay? If you don't have the pleasure of being sent to San Antonio, Texas for a week, complete your own 360 degree review, okay? There are a lot of good free assessments that are out there. You can do strength finders, you can do all those things, but learn what makes you tick. Learn what makes you respond. And so I've got some other actions up there that uh, we moved ahead. Can you go back to the foundation? Oh, sorry. So you have got some other actions that you can do. I mean, not knowing when the pizza's going to come, how long it's going to take us to get it. But there's some things in there I think that one of them I really want to talk about, which is if you have a job description, read it. Not so much for what it is, but how it might have changed. Because what you're looking for there is that if your job description is all around managing client relationships, maybe it's client development, maybe it's sales, whatever it might be, and all of a sudden that you realize that your job has changed, then you don't you have to evaluate where is my focus. So but to have the greatest impact on everything else we talk about, focus on self okay. Go to the next. So, study your accounts. And what I'm talking about there is, I kind of make a little bit of a cliche, but approach the research that you do on your account as if you're earning a degree. You're gonna, you're gonna be the doctor of ABC company. You're gonna be able to teach it. And the reason you need to be an expert is because at the end, we're going to talk about some other things, but I want you to remember that the reason you need to be an expert is that's the price of admission. And 
you've got to know your account. We've got a lot of tools up here that you can use. One day I'm looking at reports. Every day, right? Sitting there looking at reports. I had a client who you could not be more steady. If you look back, we had them for 15 years. If you look back at their 15 years of volume and productivity and, and revenue, it was like no variation at all. All of a sudden, I'm into the first quarter this year, and I see this gigantic spike. So I call the client. The client laughs. He goes, I was wondering when you're going to call. He said, you didn't see on the news that we've had a total change in the strategic direction of this company. And we're just going to grow. We're going to acquire. And you're going to have to adapt, or we're going to need somebody else. So now you've got all these tools that you can do. You can set up Google Alerts, not only on your client, but on your, maybe your key people. Whatever you can do, you can read annual reports, you can track, find out when their earnings reports and calls are. Can you listen into them? Okay, do all those things that you can time, you can do. And one of the most important things is understand their competition. Now, there's a lot so far. Start slow, okay? Figure out first some of these actions, but what are the ones that are going to have the most meaningful impact on your ability to perform? And so when you think about that, okay, then one of the things that, that I was thinking about is that, um, and it was really funny, it came clear when my friend David called me yesterday, and it's the concept, he said, luck. No, hey, sometimes it's just dumb luck, right? You're in the right place at the right time. But what David said, what? Learn, understand, communicate, and care about your client as if you work there. Because you're not going to be working where you are if you lose too many of them, right? So um, those are the things that, that I think that you need to understand. Now we'll go to the next slide. So I never. It's all about analysis is in every relationships are key. There's no doubt about it. But it still comes down to your ability to analyze. And what I'm looking at here is maybe you have a contract that's been drawn up by attorneys on both sides in your business and your business on the other side. We've all had those contracts. But, you know, I remember some of ours were 40 or 50 pages. It was all legalese. It took you forever to read it. You doubt if you could ever really understand it. But that was a binding agreement. It was signed. There's a renewal date. Take a look at the how, however, if you are in a business that you where you get service valuations, look at any of the results that you can around that account. Everybody knows what a, a SWOT analysis is on the consuming strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Here's two one on an account. But don't do it alone. Do it with your team. This is clear. <laughs> the reason you want to do it with your team is it's a really good A, team building exercise, and B, there was a study that, that was done in the early 2000s. It was called the execution quotient. Look it up. Find it on the web. What it said was that Everybody thought, for the most part, their boss worked really hard. But there was a clear disconnect with how their job, what you were doing, actually related to the goals of the company and the ability to perform. Now, you may say, hey, I can't change my company. But you can change your approach to your account with the teams and the people who support you. Okay? So if you do that and you start looking at ways and what you're looking for here is one of the things I say, compare terms and conditions versus reality. If you're doing that SWOT, you're going to learn a lot. Because one thing I learned is that the longer the contract, the more the original terms and expectations you wrote in. Okay? And all of a sudden I realized in a lot of cases, I was doing a heck of a lot more based off of an initial pricing that was built on me doing a heck of a lot less. Okay? So you can score. Don't get crazy. 
just say, hey, A, B, C, you know, A, A, they're performing above expectations, but don't get fooled, dig deep. Uh, they're performing well, but there might be a few things I might want to do, or oh my goodness gracious, we're in trouble. Okay. Um, now, here's the, here's the thing that's, that's, all these things that I'm talking about, one of the things that you've got to make sure is that you have the ability to store everything you do and track it in whatever system or CRM you might have, or if you don't have one and you're, and you, and you're using paper, um, or if you built an Excel spreadsheet, I would say take a look at upgrading it, okay? Um, but the ability to store it is great, it's important. Next one is Blueprint. Now, what I'm talking about here is the ability to identify your contacts, map your processes, and your touch points. Start with your day-to-day. -day. See how deep and wide you can go. Doc, what you're looking to do is document your client expectations and how everybody views you, okay? So one of the things that, that I would say is when one of the things I talk about here, which is when I talk about process flows, challenge your process flows, challenge your steps. Too many of us have gotten caught in, well, hey, that's the way we've always done it, right? That's why we do it here. That's the way we do it. I was listening to uh, Darren Hardy, which I, I, I listen to the guy every day, and he talked about the fact that in the artillery, there's a three-person crew, okay? But they can never figure out what that third person, everybody else knew what the role was, but the third person didn't have a job. So finally they asked, what would, why do we have this third person on this artillery crew? Well, it turned out that third person was to make sure the horse didn't get startled by the sign on the sound of the cannon. In other words, they had stayed with what, why we always, we always have three people there. But the realities are, you didn't have horses anymore, right? Not going to startle the tank, and startle the jeep that's towing it. So my point is, challenge your processes, challenge why everything's there. And one of the things that I think is really key is ask, are we easy to work with and for? None of this, hey, that's the way I did it. I had to do that. I know it's a tough job. I know there's a lot of stuff there. You just got to grin and bear it. Throw up. Be a person, right? Um, but what you really want to do is look for, how can we make it easier for our people to produce? How can we make it easier for our clients and our suppliers? To work with us. Okay. So, one of the other things that, that I think is important here is when you're going through all of your clients and you're going through um, the the interactions, you may discover that there's people that you have no contact or have never met that are key to your relationship, and so. One of the things that, that I that I talk about, one of the, watch this guys. Ooh, whoa, huh? Okay, so complete account analysis is really where I'm coming from here. And what you're looking for is whether or not you have a cultural alignment, whether you have personal lines, whether your performance is there, and whether your service is there. Okay? Those things are key, and the reason they're key, cultural alignment, right? Go deep and wide, and here's some questions that, that I want you to ask yourself as you're going through all of this analysis, and there's, there's three of them, okay? One of them is up there on the screen, which is, are we easy to work with and for? Next one is, who's the customer? Ask yourself, every time you're going through this, who is the customer? We did an analysis a while back when I was at one of the companies I worked for, and we realized that the customer wasn't the person we were dealing with every day. It was somebody who we had never met, who there was the 
the wall between us, I doubt that we could ever meet them unless we can, we didn't, but we eventually could, but in the beginning we never even asked them, we didn't even know they were there. And they were the ones who had a life and death decision on whether we stayed as a, as a supplier or not, right? Highest need, unmet, no connection. And all they got was either the filter internally or the complaints or the issues, but we never really got to talk to them. One of the other things that, that I talk about here that I want you to think is one of the people you want to think about is who was the original buyer of your services? Okay. And really where I'm going there is are they still there? And if they're not there anymore, why did they leave? And the reason you want to know that is if they left because they were not wanted anymore, then you may be tied to their legacy. Okay? I had a client once. He took our, our contact the buyer left. We got a new one. We were in total, complete question and doubt because we had been hired by that person to provide services. We had to totally rebuild the relationship. They gave me two things that I that I knew. One. We only had one connection, right? So we were always vulnerable. And two, if that person leaves under bad circumstances, we're in trouble. So next is value. So it's a cliche, I know, sorry. Value is in the eyes of the customer. So what you want to do is you want to identify what is critical quality to the client. Make no assumptions. And the best way to making no assumptions is to ask. Right? And there's two questions you should ask your client when you're trying to determine what's valuable. First one is, would it be okay if I asked you, what are we doing today? you find to be the most beneficial in our relationship. So, what are we doing today? The next question is the one that you got to be prepared in case you get the, the, the answer that you all know we can't do that. But you still want to know if there was anything that we could do better or any other thing we could add, what would it be? Okay. Give you an example. Ask that question once. We were really cool back in the day. We had interfaces, data interfaces. Our systems were talking to our client systems. We couldn't get any better, right? The only problem is our input to the client reached the desk of a person in finance, and because of the way the data was coming, every time they got a report from us, it added eight hours to their day because they had to reformat it you look at it, validate it, dump it into something else. Boy, if you could fix that, that would be a heck of a lot better for us. So, I just got the signal that food is here. Yeah. And that's the most valuable thing so far. Yeah. So, let's go get some pizza and come back in. <laughs>
started and you guys just started. Oh, sorry. And, uh, oh, sorry. And, uh, so, um, you guys stand up for the second half? I'm going to try. I'd love to have a you Sure. You know, you talk about presentations there. <laughs> Years ago, they presenting to the Department of the Art, one of the largest accounts in our business. They wanted to come to our office for a site visit. He said, of course, come to our office for a site visit. So we got the office all ready, everything done, things dusted, everything perfectly positioned. Everything was perfect, right? And on the day that that presentation was occurring, the entire area lost their power. <laughs> it was the dead of winter, it was freezing inside, and we had to present to the Department of the Army in a room with no lights except for the emergency lights, and all our technology <laughs> wasn't working, and we won. And we wanted because we were able to adapt. We knew what we were talking about, right? So um, one of the things that, before we get a little bit deeper into value, I, I jumped ahead a little bit on this. I uh, wasn't sure when we were going to be. But when I'm talking about an account analysis, here's some keys that I think that I want to make sure you all know, right? And, and one of those is you're, you're going to have a chart. I've got it here. And anybody who wants a copy, I can email it to you. Uh, just let me know. Um, but what you want to do is say, okay, what departments do we interact with? What parts of those companies do we touch? Okay. Who's the person there, the contact, whatever? Okay. As I said, were they an original purchaser or did they inherit you? Okay. What is their role? What is the frequency of contact? What are their hot buttons? What are the deliverables that they expect out of this relationship? Okay. So again, with their role, frequency, hot buttons, and deliverables. And their role, are they an owner, a user, or an influencer? And when I think of frequency, you can do it high, medium, low, which would be high, daily, weekly. You can do a medium, we monthly, quarterly, we contact them well and frequently. And the one you don't want to write too many down times is NC, no contact. Okay. And then the other thing is that you want to take a look at your account, your team inside, excuse me. And you want to know how many years has your team been servicing that, that client? Okay. Because I've had situations where my client's contacts are changing all the time. Every two to three years, they're constantly changing. My team has stayed in place 10, 15 years. We actually are the people who know more about what we're doing and how it serves that client than a lot of times the people on the inside. And that is how they rely on it. The other thing that I think is important is if you have multiple services that you can provide. Let's say that you have multiple products, multiple services. And when you look at your account, you say, hey, they're only using one. Just one of our five services or our four services. Or they're only buying one of our 10 products. Whatever it might be, one of the things you have to think about is that you are easily replaced in that situation. Okay? So what you're always looking for is how do you strengthen if those gears interlock ever more with your client. So uh, any other thing that you might want to look at is how do they view you? Do they look at you as a partner? Do they look at you as a supplier? Always hated being invited to vendor conferences. I don't know how you guys feel about that one, but I never liked it. Vendor written across your chest or on your name bag. Or you have a different color name bag. That's the one I love the best. Oh my god, he has a yellow name bag. Don't talk to him. He's a vendor. Um, sorry. So um, let's go to value. 
Okay. So values in the eyes of the customer. But we've already talked sometimes you're not looking them in the eye, right? So what what do you need to do is when you don't have that ability, you're gonna read missions, visions, and values. There's not too many people, too many companies who don't have those out there on a website, right? Um, one of the things that one of the neatest things that ever <coughs> had with a client that, that I thought was just so unique is they would have us participate in their new hire training and onboarding. So if we had a new member of our team, one of the things before they would be a permanent member of the team is they had to go to the new hire training. Because they wanted to make sure as tactical and as one-to-one -one as they could get that they would communicate to us what it meant to be there, how they felt about their company, and what their expectations of us were as a provider. So you can review RFPs. If you didn't have to respond to an RFP, go back to your contract, look at statements of works. What you're looking for and what will be revealed in a lot of cases is what they're looking for in you. What's their expectation? Okay. Next slide, please. Defense. Or as I always say, a little paranoia goes a long way. Uh, someone is always waiting in the winds or whispering in their ears to replace you. Okay. Someone always is. So how do you, one of the things that you have to make sure is that you don't give them an advantage, right? So never allow your contact to be blindsided. Basically get ahead of the story. Right? The worst thing in the world is for your phone to ring and your client or your customer to say to you, well, what are you going to do about what just happened? And you don't have a clue. Just happened. Right? And it could be anything. I don't care what business you're in. I don't care what you're providing, whether it's a service, whether however it touches, whether it's something that's supposed to show up at Cub's door. Um, hey, wait a minute. I got shelf space and there's nothing on it. You said it would be here, right? You know, I gave you four feet. I can give it back to somebody else. Okay. Sorry. I know these guys are the coolest guys. They make salsa. I'm just like, wow. Anyway, um, the other thing I want you to think about is everybody's thinking it's external, it can be internal. Right? Let's say that you're your client has outsourced a service to you that they traditionally have done inside their company. Right? You went in, you had a better story, maybe you provided it at a lower cost, whatever it may be, you're going to do it and they used to do it. If the people who used to do it are still there, they felt that you ripped something away from them, you're never going to do it better than they could have done it. And they're always going to look for when you stumble. Go back to when I talked about how many of your products or services they beat, they buy, or if you're only one to one and you blow it, and this is the first thing they ever outsourced outside of what they were doing, they were going to bring that back in. Right? It can be anything. Okay. Um, now, I'm, if I if, if Trigger was here, I'd be standing up because now I'm going to get on my soapbox. And my soapbox is how to communicate good and bad news. And I'm going to focus on the concept of communication, but in a but different than what you I think you might think, and that is because everybody's got one of these, right? Okay, so a lot of companies used to say, would say, when these were just flip phones and all you could do with them was to call somebody and they could call you, to cut their cost, they would say, hey, you know what? You can use your personal cell phone to conduct business. Well, I hardly talk on this now. 
but I text, right? I FaceTime, Skype, right? And where I'm, where I'm coming from is that if that communication that is occurring via text from one of your employees to one of your clients is business related, if it has to do with a service failure, if it has to do with a price adjustment, whatever it might have to do, if it's a text and it doesn't reside and end up in your system somewhere to keep track of it, you're in trouble. If they switch carriers, if they get a new phone, and I have phones, I have iPhones stacked up in my closet. There's stuff on that I can't get back because the system's changed or I forgot to do the back, you know, back up or whatever. My point being is, is that when you think about communication, it's not even just the way you communicate, it's where is it stored. And the other thing about managing relationships on this phone, right? I can load down, I can download apps, I can have Evernote. I can use some other note taking. I can say, hey, look at how cool I organized my files. But if it's only on my phone, and you're talking about managing, successfully managing long term business relationships, you're in trouble. So, if you, at least that's my pet peeve. I'm sorry, I wait too long. But, um, so, Develop a plan to manage change proactively. Work for a big company. A lot of times we switch accounts. I'm going to take these 10, you're going to take these two, numbers relate, services relate, profit, all that relates. So when you get used to doing it, right, every quarter, every six months, you're adjusting your, your client loads, sometimes you forget, right? You forget that all of that effort to having built a good, strong, long-term relationship on that client management account owner basis, if somebody did it really well, how do you going to manage that change? So I take over an account from one of my friends at work. We did our download. We did, the, we did what we thought was a good handoff, a joint conference call. You know, attending a couple of meetings together on paper, it looked great. When it was over, my phone rang. And the contact said, hey, Mark, if so-and-so left the company, you were the best thing that could have ever happened. But she did. And we're either going out the door or you're giving her back to me. I said, hey, have no. Uh, so we made the change back. Right? So when you're thinking of managing change and you're thinking of how you're changing the teams that contact your customers, make sure that you've got a good plan to do it in a very good way. Study the competition. We used to maintain a very large database in which we tracked all of the competitive intelligence that we could gather on our competition. And we would get it from everybody who had knowledge in our industry that worked for us. And we would update it constantly. Because you always have to know where that whisperer is. Right? For example, one of your competitors opens an office in a location where your key clients are. You're not there. You've been doing this remotely. Everybody's happy. Hey, we Skype, we FaceTime, we do video chats. Now somebody's there. They're two miles away. If you didn't know that, you wouldn't protect yourself against it, defend against it. So, okay, we'll go to the next one. How are we going to find here? Okay. So balance. So we all heard it. People like for people, all things being equal, people prefer to do business with people they know, like, and trust, right? But the thing about no like and trust that you want to write next to it is that they know you, they like you, they trust you, and that you're an expert at what you do. Everybody kind of leaves that part out. Okay? 
go back to that foundation slide that I talked about, right? The study slide. You want to make sure that when they do no like and trust, in the boldest level that letters they can do, they're also going to, in their mind, think excellent. Remember when we were the sole repository of a client's processes and how it worked because the contacts constantly changed, right? You got a new buyer, you got a new distributor, this guy's gone, they burn them out at this company. Be the people who keep it constant. So, combined business and fun, this is the one where um, seems like common sense. I've watched careers end reputations be ruined because people are out at a conference or a convention they think it's a different space or they're out for dinner and they have one too many okay um, I've seen people lose their jobs over being too out of line into what combining business is fun is all about so code of contact make sure you know what it is know what know what you can give them and you can't give them right you don't want your contact to have the mail room deliver something to their desk which is outside of company policy. Oh, so now I know why you're doing business with them. You know, they just screwed up last month and covered for it. Look what you got. Case of crap. Wow, pretty cool. No, you don't want those kind of things to happen. So here's family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. What I'm talking about there is the concept of gathering information about your client, right? Now, here's an interesting thing. Family, occupation, recreation, and dream. On the internet, you can download a document called the uh, Mackie 66, R.B. McKay, excuse me, customer profile. 66 things that you should, that he would record, he, he sold envelopes, but 66 things that he would require his salespeople and his relationship people to learn and know about their contacts. Now, when you look at it, the first thing that you're going to say, hey, I can get most of that from the internet. I can stalk them on Facebook, I can look at their LinkedIn profile, I can do all that. That's the easy way out, and that's the wrong way. I'd rather have conversation and build my file one data point at a time over a year than just saying, hey, I can download right? I can look it up. Because when you do that, what are you losing? You're losing the human connection, the person. When you have the opportunity to ask about family, occupation, recreation, dreams, when you look, when it, when it comes to stories, you know what the most important thing about a story is? The beginning. <laughs> well, it's it's fast. Nope. It creates in the mind something that you can relate to. And that's silly if something happened with me. Right? Family, occupation, recreation, dreams. My son's taken karate. Wow. So is my grandson. You know, you won't believe what happened to us on our trip. All those things you're looking to gather, right? So what I want you to do is think about that. So when, when I think about the concept of bringing this to a close, you know, I want you to remember stimulus, that space in the middle, and how your response is. Right? I want you to remember that you're always looking for keys and clues about what your customers are expecting from you and what your teams have to do to support that. No person's an island in this world. So, um, when I think about it at the end, go to the, the last slide here so we can get everybody out, is that if there was one takeaway, one action I'd ask everybody to think about as something you'd want to do, 
is that one question. Are we easy to work with? Or are we easy to work with? Okay. Is there anything in the way that I can get, get out of the way so that it's better? Relationship is better. So I hope you're able to identify some actions. For those um, who want, there's a form, please complete it. If you don't want to, you know, I understand I've been on that side of the table, but I'd love your feedback. If I'm not connected with you on LinkedIn, connect with me, please. Okay? Let me know you were here when you send the invitation. Um, and I hope this you enjoyed it. Thank you. provide day passes, would love to have any of you come in. If you want to talk to me, I can give you one on the way out. Free pass to come in and check us out at one of our locations. Come to our co-working space, drink our free Starbucks coffee and our wine and our beer and have a party. Yeah. Thanks everyone for being here. Everybody have a great day and thank you again, Martin. Okay. Appreciate thank it. You. <laughs>